Marinero, the sick podcast. And today joining me from the Montreal Gazette and Hockey Inside Out, we're talking Habs with Stu Cowan. How you doing, bud? I'm doing well, Tony. How are you? Very, very well. Uh, the only guy doing better than me right now, I would imagine, is Jake Evans, who's a pretty happy guy because after 60 games and only 60 games with the Montreal Canadiens, he's rewarded with a three-year contract extension, $5.1 million total, 1.7 per season. Like it, yes or no, and why? Yeah, I think it's a good deal. I, you know, Jake Evans is shown that he can play in the NHL. He's a responsible two-way center. They have him as a third line, or at least they did this morning at practice. Uh, I don't know if he's a third line center in the NHL. I know he can play the fourth line role. I don't know if he has enough offense to play that third line role. But I think one of the lessons Mark Bergevin learned in the offseason when he lost his Sperry Cock and Yemi is if you have young players and you like them, lock them up early. Don't let them get to that stage where an offer sheet or something like that can happen and you lose them. They like Jake Evans. They like what he brings. Uh, as I said, an intelligent hockey player, a solid fourth line center. He can play. Uh, we can kill penalties. We'll find out. It looks like we're going to find out if he can play on the third line. He was with Army and Gallagher today at practice. Uh, we'll see if he can create enough offense to stay in that role. But they like him. They wanted to keep him. Uh, I think it's a fair deal. And uh, somebody asked today, Evans, if you had thought about like, holding off on signing and banking on himself this season and see if he could have a big year and maybe get more. And he said, you know, he never dreamed three years ago when he was at university of Notre Dame, something like this would happen. Uh, he said, it's a lot of money, which it is $5 million. And he was more than happy to, to sign it and, and have that financial security moving forward. He talked about how much he loves living in Montreal and playing in Montreal. So I'm happy for the kid. He's, you know, seventh yeah. round draft pick. odds were against them. Uh, when you interview him, you can tell he's a really smart kid, both on and off the ice. Uh, you know, that concussion he had last year in the playoffs, uh, that's a little bit of a question mark moving forward if he gets another big hit. But uh, I like Jake Evans as a, as a person. I like him as a player. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a fair deal. It's a, it's a fair deal, I think, for both sides. The Sick Podcast, the show is brought to you by Essentia, the world's only natural memory foam mattress. Go to myessentia.com slash sickpod and use code sickpod for a free pillow with your purchase. Essentia, beyond organic sleep. All right, okay. You know one guy who's been sleeping? is Ryan Paling. So much so that today he found himself on the fifth line, and that means he's out of the lineup. Stu, I'm going to come out and say it. I just don't think he's that good. Period. Well, he's certainly looking like he might join a long list of Habs first-round draft picks who haven't panned out for one reason or another. Uh, as you mentioned today at practice, he was on the fifth line. Alex Belzil was on the fourth line playing wing. Uh, when you know, Dominic Ducharme was asked about it after practice, he doesn't like numbering his lines, and he said that Palin will be in the lineup uh, tomorrow night. He will, be, he will be on the third line, Ducharme said, even though he doesn't like numbering his lines. But, yeah, I mean, they've given Palin every opportunity, playing in a lot of the preseason games, to show that he belongs. And uh, he really hasn't, you know, he hasn't shown that. He hasn't shown that he's yeah. 100% ready to play in the NHL. And I think, you know, that first NHL game he played when he had the three goals and then he yeah. scored out he was riding high he came back the next year at training camp i was at that game in bathurst when he had the concussion playing against the, the panthers in a preseason game he was really upset when he got sent back to laval uh, he pouted when he went there and i think that was a bit of a mark on him there against them as far as canadian's management was concerned the way he handled that and he just hasn't been able to seem to rebound from that thing is he was never an offensive player in university look at his university stats he was never a big offensive player yeah but He's just, he hasn't, he just, ha he hasn't looked great. Like he hasn't caught your eye or my eye watching him in the preseason. And, Stu, and if I can, play. from what I've been told, he did a lot of pouting in Laval last year too. And mm -hmm. I know, by the way, by the numbers, he did pretty well in Laval, but I've been told he wasn't always a happy camper in Laval. So I, you know, I probably want to take back one of the things I said when I said, I just don't think he's that good. I don't think he's that good at center. And I don't think he's an NHL center. And I'm going to tell you this. If he ever makes the National Hockey League, which I believe he will play in the National Hockey League, I see it on the wing. I don't see it at center. He's, he's not a very good defensive hockey player. Um, he's not overly, you know, he's not consistent. Um, he doesn't have high IQ. How is he a centerman? Good question. And as you said, you know, when you get sent down, there's two ways you can do it, right? You can go down there and say, I'm going to prove these guys they were wrong and work your butt off and get yourself back up here. Um, Victor Mete did that when he was sent down to Laval. He went down there, worked hard, found his way back up here. Um, and he just, you know, a kid like him, a first-round pick, 
probably never been cut from a, a never mind a hockey team, any sports team in his life. Yeah. Good athlete, always a star player, always a star guy. And then when things he's not unique in that situation, you know, all these guys that get to the NHL were great players, the best players on their team as kids growing up, even if they're fourth liners in the NHL. Yeah. Some of them get to the NHL and they can they realize that, okay, you know, I'm not going to be the star here. I need to find the role. Michel Terran used to have a great line. You know, there's different chairs on a hockey team and you need to find out which chair you fit in. And I think Ryan Paling hasn't figured out what chair he fits in and the Canadians haven't figured it out either. As you mentioned, you know, wing probably looks more probable for him moving forward. But the fact today at practice, uh, Bill Zills on that fourth line uh, at wing with Perot and Lekkonen, uh, to me, speaks volumes, even though Dominic Ducharme said after practice that he doesn't like to count the, you know, put numbers on the lines and that Paling will be in the lineup uh, tomorrow night. But I think Paling's in the lineup tomorrow night is one last chance. So, okay, yeah. your last chance to show us that you belong, you were in a spot on this team. But, Stu, when you play collegiate hockey in the States, uh, you spend less time on the ice and more time in the gym. Yeah. I think it's the three years at St. Cloud, I think he never played more than 36 games in a season because of short seasons, of course. When you play junior hockey in Canada, you spend a lot more time on the ice than you do in the gym because you end up playing 70-plus games. In his case, uh, he's got the body, but he doesn't have the games in him. He just he doesn't have the games. He's got, what, three seasons of 35 or 36 games, and at the American Hockey League level, he's played 64 games. I mean, once upon a time, Thomas Plakenitz, if memory serves me well, played 250 games at the American Hockey League level, as a much better player, much smarter player than Ryan Paling. Ryan Paling needs to play more hockey. He's not ready. A lot of people want to see him in the lineup because they like youth, they like enthusiasm, they like big bodies. Um, but at the same time, if he's not ready, he's not ready. He's not ready, Stu. Well, and you mentioned COVID screwed things up also, right? There wasn't a full season in the AHL last year. So yeah. you know, send them down to the AHL. I think that's going to happen. And, you know, make him your first line center, play him on the power play, play him penalty kill, play, play the hell out of him and, and, and see how he does. And you're right with, you know, the 36 games, that's a, a, a regular university NCAA season. And, you know, Cole Caulfield, a lot of people talk about Cole Caulfield coming to this season, expecting to score 30 goals, expecting to be rookie of the year. You got to remember, Cole Caulfield's never played more than 36 games in a season either. So the 82-game NHL grind is a lot different than – what you get in NCAA hockey, uh, as far as the amount of games play, right? they spend a lot of time in the gym. There's a lot of, I think there's a lot more pluses for, for players playing NCAA hockey than there are playing junior hockey. Uh, the one plus with junior hockey is that obviously you get 72 games or whatever. It's closer to an NHL type schedule. And right now with Ryan Paling, I agree with you. He looks like he just needs to play more. And maybe if he goes down to Laval and they put him in the first role, and if he doesn't pull the uh, sulk or pout, and goes down there and says, I'm going to be a dominant force in the AHL. That's what he has to do. I mean, in my opinion, that's what you do. You send them back and you have them, you tell them, you got, you have to dominate. Like you can't be an average player or a slightly above average player in the AHL. If you want to play in the NHL, you have to dominate at the AHL level and put them there and give them the opportunity to do it. He is a first round pick. Yeah. You don't want to give up on him, uh, but he's got to prove something uh, this year. And, and again, uh, that concussion he had uh, in that preseason obviously threw him threw him back a little bit, and uh, COVID last year with you know not many games in, in the American Hockey League, but it certainly looks like there's gonna be a full season in the American Hockey League. And I, I think a full season playing in the AHL would not be a bad thing for Ryan Paling at this point. The NHL is starting up in less than ten days. Same thing for the NBA. The NFL season is going on. If you want a jersey, sportbuffshop.com for all of your officially licensed sports apparel and more. And our sick merch as well. Use code SICK15 for 15% off on all of their items. All right. Matthew Perot on a fourth line at practice today. Stu, considering that Paling is struggling, and I don't think he's going to make the Habs out of camp, they better hope that Perot pans out because if it doesn't, with all due respect to Paquette, your center line is going to be after Suzuki and Dvorak. It's going to be Evans and Paquette. And in an ideal world for the Canadians to be a very good team, with all due respect to Jack Evans, he's got to be a fourth line center. If it's going to be Evans third line and Paquette fourth line, I'm not going to be crazy about the Canadians at center if that's the case. No, as I mentioned earlier, I think Jake Evans has proven he's a solid fourth line center who can kill penalties. I just don't know if the offense is there for him to be a third liner. And, you know, with the Perot today between uh, Lekin and Bilzilla at practice, and they also had Perot, it was interesting, rotating in on the second power play unit 
uh, him and Joel Armia were sort of rotating in and out. Armia uh, had a couple of plays on the power play where he was trying to make a pass through the middle. It was picked up and was obviously sure to shot. And they took him off and they put Perot in there. And you'd see Dominic Ducharm talking with Armia. They obviously they wanted to shoot in that position. But yeah, I agree with you. For we had this question last season too, right? Uh, after last season, it was after. Uh, you know, Philip Deneau and, and Suzuki, what's going to happen after that. So now you have two proven centers. And again, the rest of it, as I said, Jake Evans has proven himself to me as a, a fourth line center, but then you have Perot and you have Paquette, the two guys that, you know, can, can fill in at that center role also, but it, it drops off significantly after the, the, the top two. And uh, that's to me, that that's a, one of the big concerns going into the season for the Canadians. Mark Bergevin has to go out and get a centerman. Because Perot hasn't played a lot of center in the last four years. And we do know that at one point his back was flaring up because of taking faceoffs. Mm-hmm. Okay, I get it. He can still play center and have someone else take the faceoffs. I don't think Mark Bergevin has any other choice. Uh, in the final year of his contract, uh, you need to make the playoffs after you were a couple of wins away from winning the Stanley Cup. Uh, he's got to go out and get somebody at center. Well, I think he's going to start the season with what he has. And see how things go and then figure out from there. But I mean, you know, with waiver wires and whatnot coming up, you'll see, we always try to pick up a goalie on waivers. We'll see what happens with that. Also, yeah. uh, that's a possibility, but you know, centers are hard to find. Good centers are really hard to find. And okay. uh, you now Ryan Paling is a guy when they drafted him, they saw him as a potential to be a you know third, fourth line center. And in a perfect world right now, you'd have Ryan Paling as your third center and Jake Evans as your fourth center. And I think that would have been the plan the Canadians would have liked. And, and if that, is who you have. That's not if Ryan Palin being the player they thought he was going to be or hoping yeah. be, that would be a pretty solid down the middle. But you know the fact that Ryan Palin hasn't stepped up and proven he can be a third line type center that bumps Jake Evans into a role that he I don't think is ready for. I, I, I love him to prove me wrong. I love Jake. Yeah. Maybe he'll get this opportunity. Uh, you know, maybe playing with Army and Gallagher, he'll show that he has a little bit more offense in him, and I'd love to see that. But I haven't seen anything up to this point that shows me that will happen. Again, I'd love to be proven wrong by Jake Evans. So that's, yeah, so now you have the place where, you know, they went out. You know, he said he needs to get a centerman. Well, he got Paquette, and then he got Perot, as you said, although Perot's played mostly wing the last few years, and back problems were part of that. So I think he's going to see – I think Bergeron is going to see what he's got through the first few games. And if he realizes that it's really not working out, then I agree. He'll have to go up and try and get another center. But that's A couple easy. of excellent performances, but then a hiccup on Friday night in Ottawa where Caden Gooley went minus three on that night. Does he start the season? Would you start him in Montreal? I, If everybody was healthy, I wouldn't. Uh, Joel Edmondson hasn't, you know, hasn't, again, he wasn't on the ice today. Uh, he's hurt. Um, you know, they had, they had Gouley with David Savard again today. And, you know, today was the first day of practice. It's down to one team. A lot of cuts were made. Laval opened its camp today. So the guys that are stuck around have proven they obviously deserve to stick around. So it wouldn't shock me if he started uh, just to see, as I say, they're missing guys, just to see how he handles it. I think he's definitely mature enough to handle being up here. And then if he was sent down, he seems like a really – smart, intelligent, uh, mature beyond his years type of kid. Um, obviously, with the Kakanyemi situation, uh, the Canes are, are maybe a little more hesitant about bringing a, well, he's 19 now, bringing a young kid into the NHL directly from junior. Yalchenyuk before him. Yalchenyuk before him, and especially talking to defensemen now. As you mentioned, minus three, that ain't not a defense is a hard position in the NHL yeah. for a young kid. And, uh, you know, a minus three night in the preseason, you sort of go, okay, it's a preseason. If that happens on opening night, or another night, uh, it's, it's a bigger deal. Um, and what do you make on that note, uh, you on young defensemen, what do you make of Victor Mete telling reporters um, it's it's nice to have coaches um, who are um, okay when you make a mistake, um, uh, unlike my last team where if I'd made a mistake, they'd pull me out of the lineup. I'm not surprised he said that because I think that's one of the issues that Canadians have had with their young players is that they're not willing to let them – make mistakes and learn from them and have confidence that they can learn from them. I think that's part of what led to Kakinyemi leaving Montreal. Yeah. Healthy scratch for the last two games of uh, the Stanley cup final while Eric Cole played and Eric Cole with no future with the Canadians. And here's just very Kakinyemi. Eric Stahl, Eric Stahl. Eric Stahl, sorry. With that's no, okay. Uh, yeah. With new, what did I say? Eric Cole. Eric Cole. So that's, yeah, Eric Once Stahl. upon a time. Once upon a time. So yeah. So, uh, you know, Kakinyemi, that was a slot. He was obviously upset. That was a, a really upsetting to him and part of 
one of the reasons he wanted to get out of here. And I think it's been a thing. Also, you look at Alexander Romanov, you know, he played 54 games last season, I believe it was. And then they decided he wasn't good enough to play in the playoffs. And they were playing two guys they picked up at the trade deadline instead of him. And I was watching Romanov at practice today and he's been with Petrie and it's only practice up, but you like, he can skate, he can shoot. They had him working on the power. He's so talented, but he's a young kid and he's going to make mistakes. And sometimes yeah. you need to let young kids make mistakes and live with them and deal with them. And especially the Canadians, like I can't think of a better defense coach to have to teach young kids from their mistakes than Luke Richardson. As Jeff Petrie has told me many times, one of the things he really likes about Luke Richardson, he never yells and screams. He doesn't freak out behind the bench. He's very calm and cool. He'll point out your mistakes. He realizes a guy who used to play. Luke Richardson played in the NHL when he was 18 years old for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah. He knows what it's like to be a young player in the NHL. He knows what it's like to make mistakes in the NHL. So I'm not surprised Victor Mete said that. And I think some of the other younger guys, like maybe even a Romanov, might have been nodding their head going, yeah, that's sort of like me. Every time I'm on the ice, I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake and I'm going to be uh, sent up to the press box. So. Playing defense in the NHL is hard enough uh, in the best of times. It's even harder if every time you think you're going to make a mistake, it's going you're going to lose your job. Uh, I think that makes it even harder. And now Brett Kulak is a guy, when Kulak is playing, is confident, and you can tell he's confident. He's a really good defenseman. But he's yeah. one of those guys that, you know, he makes one or two mistakes. He's a healthy scratch. And when he comes yeah. back, he's different. He's a different player. You can tell he's afraid, you know, his his – Strength is his ability to skate the puck out of danger and, and and be mobile. And when he comes back after being scratched, I always see he's, he's sort of he's hesitant a lot. And and that's to- and still, that's one of the reasons why I don't want Gooley to start the season here, right? Because he's going to make mistakes in the most impatient market uh, with the most pressure on any coach, with the most pressure on any general manager of any team in the league. That's the Montreal Canadiens, and uh, you know it's 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 a lot harder here than it is anywhere else. Besides that, I've seen this movie so many times before, even before this previous management team with uh, Mike Ribeiro and Guillaume Latendres having great training camps. And then all of a sudden the public falls in love with them. They rushed them here. And you realize a couple of years later that the Canadians did them a disservice and they would have been much better off had they not started here. So now well, speaking if, of mistakes. Yeah. If Edmondson and Norlander were both healthy, I don't think there's any way, any chance Gooley starts the season with the Canadians. The fact they're not makes it a different scenario, right? So yeah. um, I could, I wouldn't be shocked if he starts the season until the other guys are healthy. Yeah. And then I think the best thing for Gooley this year is to go back to junior. I think the best thing is to go play for the World Juniors where there's a good chance he'll be captain. 100%. But I think to start him here and let him play four or five games until the other guys are healthy. They I have that option for sure. I don't think that's a really bad option because you can find it. You can get a look and see if you think the kid is ready. Uh, there'll be less pressure on the kid because if you handle him right and tell him, look, we're starting you here. We want to see what you're going to do. We're going to send you back to junior when everybody's healthy. Yeah. You know, this is a sort of a, a little bit of a trial for you, a little bit of get a taste of what it's like to be in the NHL, get a taste yeah. of what it's like to go on an NHL road trip, get a taste of what it's like to be in the locker room, which I think if it's five, six games or whatever until the other guys are healthy and then you send yeah. them down, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And if maybe he surprises everybody and he looks like he can play in the NHL at 19 years old, but I'd be I'd be hesitant to take that path with him through a full season. But I don't the fact with the injuries that are, are coming into play right now, yeah, uh, I don't think it's a horrible thing if they were to start him here to start the season until everybody's healthy and then send them back to junior. Speaking of taste, Cherry River, hard seltzer, only 90 calories, natural flavors, no preservative stew, now available in Quebec grocery stores and at the beer uh, store. This one, by the way, is uh, peach basil, all right? Pretty good. Cheers to Caden Gooley uh, and hoping all the best for you. Now, this is what we know on defense. You talked about Edmondson hurt, Niku hurt, Norlander hurt, uh, Romanov in his second season, Kulak struggles with consistency, Weidman looks like he's Eric Gustafson reincarnated, which is he looks like he can help them on the power play, but he looks like he'll be a liability on defense with all due respect to him. Uh, I, I Look, this is going to change every day probably, but today at the time of this recording, Monday, October 4th, Hoffman's hurt. Uh, the defensemen that we talked about are hurt. Jake Allen doesn't look like the Jake Allen that he was a year ago. Carey Price is hurt and unlikely to start game one. Now he's sick today. 
Uh, Ryan Paling hasn't had a good camp. Paquette's probably going to end up being your number four. Or it might be Perot. Drew Wayne, as good as he looked, until we see uh, a, a bigger sample, we never know. Mike Hoffman, I, 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm less excited right now about this team at this stage than I was about last year's team that started the season in the middle of January. It has not been a good training camp because of all those injuries, as you say. It's just like every day it's somebody else goes down. You know, today Carey Price was supposed to be on the ice today. He wasn't. Yeah. Uh, Donald Ducharme said he's sick. He said it's not COVID-related. He'll be at, he said he'll be at the rink tomorrow. We're not sure if he's going to be on the ice or not. Uh, highly, highly unlikely he's going to start the season. And when will he start? Who knows? Because I you know the Canes have never been right in predicting when Carey Price will return from any injury. So who knows how long he's going to be out? As you said, yeah. The, a positive has been that as you said, the Vorak Drew Anderson line has looked really good <clears throat> in practice. I was watching today on the power play, Drew on the power play in practice. It, again, it's only in practice. He really looked good moving the puck around and shooting the puck and that. But yeah, there's a lot of things that have happened during this train. There's more bad things than good things that have happened during this training camp, without a doubt. And Norlander's a guy I thought uh, would have a. He impressed me at the rookie camp. He impressed me early in the camp. Heard again. Heard. I thought he was a good chance he was going to start the season with the team. Yeah. But now there's so much up in the air. I mean, there's another week and a little over a week to go. Uh, we'll see who gets healthy before then. With Edmondson, uh, Dom Ducharme said today, is like the injury's not getting any worse, but it's not getting any better. They thought he'd be back by now. They were pretty sure he'd be back by now. Not but good. On the ice, skating by himself. It looks like it's a lower body thing just from watching the drills he's doing. So whether it may be a groin or something like that, I'm speculating, but it certainly looks like it's a lower body thing just by watching the drills he's going through. Yeah. So a lot, of, a lot of bad news from this training camp uh, so far. Well, the thing is, Heading into camp, the good thing was, you know, Dominic Charm was finally going to get a full training camp, get his system in 100%, get his line set, get everything in. He hasn't been able to really do that. You know, Cole Caulfield was out of yeah. work with Brendan Gallagher in that slot. You know, today we found out Gallagher's with Evans and Armia. So I want to talk to you about Gallagher in ending, okay, in ending. A year ago, Philip Deneau wasn't happy because he wasn't happy with his role, that it was going to be a lesser role, and he wanted to be on a more offensive role. He wanted to be the second-line centerman, and, uh, and be able to have the green light on offense. One year later, actually less than that, nine months or whatever it is, the Canadians, it looks like, will probably start their season with Brendan Gallagher on a third line if the lines were any indication that we saw today. So Cole Caulfield will play first line right wing. Brendan Gallagher looks like he'll play third line right wing. And I know Ducharme says he does a number of lines, but he just wants to avoid controversy. Every coach does, and every fan does, and every analyst does. Do you think Gallagher will be as disappointed as Dano was nine months ago that he'll have a lesser offensive role, even though Brendan will always say the right things and did today, saying that if he plays first line or fourth line, it doesn't change the way he plays. Are you worried that he might be disappointed by a lesser role? No. He... First of all, one difference is Gallagher already has his contract extension in hand or a very lucrative deal that he signed. That's one difference from then. Oh, he did. It's a pride thing, though. It's a pride thing. He's it's a pride watching. thing, but Brendan Gallagher has been doubted his entire career. And I'm not saying the Canadians are doubting him now. I think they just think that's the best fit for him on the third line. And as Gallagher said the other day, his game doesn't change. It doesn't matter who he plays with. He does the same thing. Ducharme said the same thing. You know, you dump it in the corner when you're on his line. You know he's going to go get it. You throw it in front of the net. You know he's going to be there. Gallagher, whatever line Gallagher starts on, and it's probably not the line he's going to end on. And also today at practice, they had him practicing on the second power play unit. Uh, so he's going to get power play time, it looks like. Um, and I, I don't worry about Brendan Gallagher. I mean, he is – a lot of guys just say the right thing. Yeah. I think Gallagher says the right thing, and I think he believes what he's saying when he talks. I don't think yeah. – he's very honest, Brendan, when you interview him. And um, you can tell if he's, if he's disappointed. He has a sort of a different – vibe to him the way he talks so i think you know he's playing with your army is a, 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 a i think army a, i think gallagher can bring out you know you talk about gallagher being doing maybe dominic ducharme's thinking about this i watch your army man he's got the size he's got the speed he's yeah. got the skill he's got the shot you can't get the puck off him when he doesn't want you to take a he can hit he's got like this guy should be a star in the nhl he should be a star there's a reason why he was a first round pick and 
Dominic Ducharme, maybe his thinking is maybe Brendan Gallagher can bring that out of Yule Armia, playing on a line and with Evans also, two really hard-working guys. Uh, Evans is you know not going to score a lot of goals, but he'll be able to get loose pucks and give them to Armia. So, and today, watching it practice on the power play, two or three rotations in a row, Armia had a perfect setup for a one-timer. He stopped it. He made a pass, intercepted, puck goes out. Ducharme pulled him aside. You could tell, like, shoot the puck. He's got a great shot. I think they. I think in one of the uh, the polls uh, and, and, or one of the surveys, they serve. Yeah, they, I think he got one of the best shots on the team, if not the best shot, right? I mean, to drive the message home, Ducharme took him off, and he put Matthew Perot in that spot. Yeah. So shoot the puck. We want to put you in this spot, but if you're gonna go there, none of these pat. When you get the puck set up there, you one time it. And uh, watching Ducharme practice, it impressed me just the way he handled it. Like he spoke to him, and he wasn't yelling at him or nothing. And then, but then, whoop. You sit and watch for a while. And we're going to put Matsu Perot in there at spot. Yeah. Two. I think it, part of it could be just, I think Brendan Gallagher can bring a lot out of Yul Army. And I think there's a lot. I, I've, I've written this and I've said this before. I don't think Yul Army realizes how good he is. I, I mean that. Like, I don't know if he realizes what a good hockey player he could be. And he's the nicest guy in the world. In an interview, he says that he, he, he's so shy. Oh, he, Stu, Stu, he has a consistency issue because if he didn't, then he would be one of those dominant players, right? And like Stefan Richer scored 50 goals twice in a three-year span. Yeah. Uh, but if he would have played 82 games uh, at 100%, he would have been one of the top five or six players in the NHL back in the day. But... You know, yeah. he just did Ducharme it, and that's... Ducharme likes to talk about how Gallagher brings a galley spice to the team. Yeah. Uh, Yule Armia needs a, a little galley spice on Yule Armia would be a very good thing. And, In ending uh, with Brendan Gallagher, he said something last year, which is one of my favorite quotes. I don't focus on proving people wrong. I focus on proving people right. I just, yeah. I love that quote. It always sticks with me. I think yeah, I'm going to use it sometime. Actually, I think I just did. Yeah. Have a good one, Stu. Always okay, fun. You too, Tony. Take care, All right. Man. It's now time to make some cash. Money, 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 money. It's time for Sick Bits. Brought to you by MyBookie. You can place your bets on MyBookie. Go to mybookie.ag slash the sick podcast to use code SICKPICKS to double your deposit. Bet, win, get paid. He's my buddy Cash. His handle is I run my bets. Cash, I just came back from vacation and I spent a lot of it. I need to make it back. Give me a play. What's happening, guys? NHL season on the cusp of the return. I'm super excited. We did super great in the playoffs last year. I'm going right into the action, guys. Uh, the, the Maple Leafs and the Canadians, the second day that the season starts. I'm going back back, right back to the shed with the Canadians, guys. Plus one. You're crazy. Five. You're crazy. Guys, listen, hear me out. There is so much parity in the NHL. In the, NHL the worst team in the league is going to still win about 37 38% of their games. The fact that Montreal is that big of an underdog is absurd. Just looking at the bets right now, guys, it's a limited marketplace. The lines haven't been out for that long, but I'm seeing about 85% of the public on Toronto. We know how this goes, guys. There's way too much parity in the NHL for Montreal to be that big of an underdog. And let's let let's not forget the fact this Montreal team came within three games of winning the Stanley Cup. I'm seeing some massive disrespect on Montreal. The books have them power ranked like 16th or 17th in the league in terms of odds to win the Stanley Cup. I think it's absurd, guys. My number is around plus 125. I think if you place this bet a thousand times, you come out a winner in the end. Give me Montreal to beat Toronto. Uh, plus 165. I think the number is way too high. Again, way too much parity. Get me this play, guys. Let's get to the window and start off the season with a winner. The Canadians were also the team that came within a goal of actually being eliminated uh, in five games by Toronto. <laughs> Listen, you know what I say? With all due respect to you, Toronto's going to be playing their Stanley Cup in game one in front yeah. of their fans versus the Canadians. Yeah. I'll take Toronto minus one and a half, but guess what? I don't do this for a living. You do. So if I was you, I'd listen to him, but I still think Toronto's going to win, if that makes sense to you. See you, Cash. Talk to you later. Sounds good. The Sick Podcast. I'm Marinero. Until next time, salute.